Hey, I'm here with Austin Roos. He is the president of CFAM, Center for Family and Human Rights. He's also the author of two books, two books last year. He's been busy writing. And he speaks and lectures for and at the UN. And so I wanted to have him on today to talk about the UN, talk about his books, and also talk about current events in the Catholic Church, uh, where he's at in Washington, D.C. So, Austin, welcome. You should tell people how long I have known you. You know, we met uh, 2006 at the Catholic Information Center, and you took me out to lunch several times, taught me all about Catholics, politics, D.C., <laughs> enough for me to leave a year later. I didn't, I didn't, want, I didn't want any more of it. <laughs> but you've stayed. You've stayed in purgatory. So... And you told me one time that you made the final decision to convert while you were at the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast. Is that correct? Am I remembering that yep, correctly? That's right. I came up um, on the invitation of uh, Bill Stetson, Father Bill Stetson. And um, yeah, that kind of sealed it. You know, met some, yeah. met some great people, met a lot of great Catholics. And um, yeah, and that's where I got hired to do the Catholic Information Center, and I renounced Holy Orders as an Episcopal priest, and like a uh -huh. week or two later, I flew up to D.C. and, and started there. That's where I met you, so wow. you're one of the first probably 25 Catholics I ever met, you know, as a Catholic. Now, I helped found that event, by the way. You did? I didn't know that. Yeah, what yeah, yeah I, was one of the, I was one of the founders of the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast. When, when did so you, when did that so how, did you, how did you know Stetson? Oh, through the... Um, the privilege, the, the whatever yeah, that was so called. So there was the pastoral provision. Yes. And Bill Stetson was the point guy for the right. CDF in America. So any Episcopal priest that was coming into the Catholic Church, this was, you know, back in 2000s, uh, would go through Father Stetson. And so yeah, what a wonder, what when a I started priest. that process, I met him. I met him the first time that weekend for the uh, Catholic prayer breakfast. Huh. And uh, so you had been in touch on the phone or whatever phone, up to then. Yeah. On the phone, and we met in person. Now, were, you, were you married yet? I was married. I had fourth baby on the way. Wow. Yep. And so I met Father Stetson. We hit it off. He offered me a job, and we went to D.C. And that fourth baby was born on the feast of Jose Maria. So his name is Jude Ambrose Jose Maria. He was huh. baptized at St. John's in McLean. Yeah. Ah, I was just in St. John's yesterday. I just want to say that you have the second most beautiful uh, wife um, in our circles. <laughs> yes. yes, you have a beautiful wife as well. Yeah, yep. yeah. I was at St. John's yesterday. Kathy and I decided to go to the traditional Latin mass that they have there okay. uh, at noon on Sunday. And we just happened to stroll into a mass that was being put on by the Institute of Christ the King Sovereign Priest. Uh -huh. And it at just St. happened John's. to be hmm. a, a young priest uh, who I saw, whose ordination I saw a couple of weeks ago in St. Louis with Cardinal Burke. And it was just a total wow. providential thing. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the ordination was four hours long. Wow. Four hours long. It was and in St. John's? It was, no, the ordination oh. was in St. Louis at wow. the oratory of St. Um, St. Francis de Sales in downtown St. Louis. Okay. The, the church that was given to the Institute of Christ the King sure. by, by then Archbishop Burke. And and uh, but then yesterday it was his first uh, solemn high mass, um, mm. so we we were delighted to be there. And it was two hours long. <laughs> wow, at St. John's, that was at St. John's. St. John's, yeah. You know, one thing yeah. I liked about St. John's, well, I don't like that it's in the round. It's horrible. So, but they've re they've appointed it nice, traditional, nice altar, tabernacle. But the joke is, is you could always either go versus Populum or at Orientum. You just. Yeah. You just pick your side, you know? That's so very we always funny. picked the Ad Orientum side when we were there. You know, and I'll tell you what, there wasn't a lot of room in that area yeah. for all the priests that they had assisting this this priest at the Mass. I mean, there were like, I don't know, there were like 10 or 15 guys in that yeah. little area. Yeah. And it was remarkable to watch, but it was it was wonderful. That's wonderful. Great. That's wonderful. So um, let's talk about UN. Right. And let's talk about Catholicism. You'd mentioned uh, Cardinal Burke. I saw that he wrote the foreword for your recent book. Yes, he did. And that yes, you're, I've, I've met him before. Wonderful man, holy man, prophetic for our time. You know him a lot better than I do. Um, where does he fit in this giant mess in the Catholic Church right now with uh, confusion when it comes to doctrine, uh, pro-life confusion, immigration debates, um, and then recently this giant 
scandal of pedophilia and homosexuality. Um, he's been kind of a standalone cardinal. Uh, what's your take on on what his role is right now? Well, I, you know, I, I uh, I've known him for a long time. You know, Kathy and I got married in two thousand and three, and in the first year of our marriage, we had uh, three miscarriages. Mm. And he had heard this on the pro life jungle drums. And since I'm from St. Louis. He reached out and he said that year, uh, come and see me at Christmas when you're home. And so we did. And he blessed us with a piece of John Mola's wedding dress. Wow. And he said, he had this cherubic huh. look on his face after he did it. And he said, he said, I've done this eight times and it's worked eight times. And, and we didn't know, but at that moment, Kathy was two weeks along with our first daughter, Lucy, wow. who, did, who didn't miscarry. Who came to term beautiful. Yeah, I've seen her on, on uh, Facebook. Beautiful girl. Yeah. Wonderful. And then uh, three years later, when Kathy's 42, along comes another baby wow. uh, who we actually named for, for Gianna Mola. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how I first met him. Uh, I'm doing a book with him right now. Uh, we're doing an interview book. Oh, great. Um, that uh, Tan will be bringing out at some point. Uh, he and I are working through, I mean, it's a very difficult editorial process to get everything right, and he's got advisors that are advising him. So uh, that was actually one of the reasons that I went to St. Louis earlier uh, in, in August was to go to the, to the ordinations and also spend a little time with him talking about the book, which, which I did. And so, so what's his role? Gosh, his role is truth teller, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, beacon of, of light uh, um, and uh, lack of confusion. Um, you know, I spoke to him about the, the current issues with, uh, uh, you know, Cardinal McCarrick, or now Archbishop McCarrick, and, and all of this. And he's, he's disgusted, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he, he did battle with Cardinal McCarrick back in the day, back in yes. 2004. Um, you know, uh, Burke was one of these archbishops then in St. Louis, and he was leading the effort to say, you know, pro-abortion politicians are not welcome to present themselves for communion in my diocese, in my archdiocese. And, and he came under a lot of flack for that. And uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, who was the head of, uh, the, uh, uh, of CDF, um, sent a, uh, a letter to um, McCarrick to share with the body of bishops that were meeting that year in Denver. And in the letter, it explained that it's perfectly acceptable to do what Burke was doing and that abortion is the most important issue, more important than the death penalty. And he said specifically that one may disagree on the death, on the death penalty, mm -hmm. but one can't agree, disagree on the abortion right. issue. Well, McCarrick did not give that letter to the body of bishops. He yeah. it talked about it. And, and misrepresented it, right? And left out the key part. And this wasn't discovered until later when, when Burke was meeting with, with Ratzinger privately in Rome and talking about this. And, and Ratzinger said, well, didn't you get my letter? And Burke said, no. And it actually at that moment was on an obscure Italian website. And so they just pulled it up and he gave it to And that's when it became quite obvious that somebody had been playing hokey pokey with the truth. Yes, yes. I've always wondered why didn't... Um why wasn't Burke appointed to DC? Well, you know, Burke was Burke was very controversial in St. Louis. You yeah. mean before he went to after he went to after St. Louis or before St. Louis? Uh, after, or w instead of being positioned in Rome, which is good, I understand that. But you know, we need some warriors over here. You know, on the homeland. You know, um, his experience in St. Louis was very controversial, and we're going to get it. We get into this in the book. Okay. Um, there, there were big battles that he fought in St. Louis, and and a lot of people in St. Louis were not happy with him. Mm -hmm. um, so he was very controversial in St. Louis. There, there was one big issue with a with a Polish church uh, that was separately incorporated um, and and did not fall within the hierarchical structure of the church. And he wanted to bring them in mm. and it was very controversial. They said Burke was trying to steal their money. Um, and, uh, right. they, they later, it later became a, a focal point for radical Catholicism in St. Louis. Mm. Um, and I think that the board was excommunicated. He also at that time excommunicated some, uh, women who, uh, went through ordination and yeah. you should read his, 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 uh, his, 
paper on the, the, the actual excommunication paper is stunningly beautiful. Mm -hmm. So he took on some fights that other people weren't willing to take on, in, including communion for pro-abortion politicians. Right. So I, I think that he left there, I don't want to say under a cloud, but in, in controversial circumstances. So it probably would not have made sense for him to go to Washington and that it made perfect sense for him to go to Rome. And, you know, and he was promoted. He was, you know, the head of the apostolic signatory. He was on the bishop's committee. So all of that made sense. And it was very, probably more important for him to be on the bishop's committee than anything else. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was probably a, a, not necessarily a bad thing that he didn't go to Washington. Yeah. So since he didn't go to Washington, how is it that under Benedict and moving into our own time period, we've had some, um, interesting appointments stateside here. I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is know, beyond me. Yeah. I, I, I have no idea. I mean, the question, I mean, the, 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 the question of the day, uh, putting aside other appointments, but the question of the day is how in the world did somebody like McCarrick um, land these jobs when you talk to people? And I mean, I had heard this, you know, when I was living in New York. Oh, you heard about, you know, you know, McCarrick got this beach house and yada, 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 mm -hmm. you know. So it's like everybody knew this thing, including people who could do something about it. Um, and it was left to, you know, this uh, priest in New York named Boniface Ramsey, uh, uh, at yeah. that time a Dominican, you know, who was my spiritual director for a while. Really? And I had no idea he was this kind of hero. None. No idea. Wow. It shocked me. So you're very close with bon Father Boniface Ramsey? For a time, yeah. And where and is he now? What is, I, I've heard, seen his name in the newspapers and all that, but I haven't. What's I lost touch with him for a long time, and I after this broke, I tracked him down. He's he's a uh, pastor of a small parish in the Upper East Side of New York. Okay. But you know, he was pastor of uh, Saint uh, Saint Vincent Ferrer. Oh, you know, New one York. of the most of one of the most important New parishes York. in New York, one of the most beautiful yeah. churches yeah, in Dominican. the United States. Yeah. And so I I think what I don't know I think he might have left the Dominicans, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think that he was he was punished for what he tried to do. So I emailed him and told him I was, I was proud to know him. Proud yeah, to know him. for sure. For sure. You know, reading on this, it goes back, you know, there's even these rumors around Cardinal Spellman and homosexuality in New York. And it seems like mainly in the east, on the eastern side of the U.S. You know, I'm thinking like uh, Philadelphia, New York, Washington, D.C., all these seas seem to have been corrupted. Do you think this goes back to like what Bella Dodd was talking about? Uh, and these these socialist communist plants um, that are intentional, or do you think these are just bad picks for ordination? I mean, what? How did this get? get how did the ball get rolling with Spellman and others? Well, you the know, from that I, era I too. I don't know anything about Spellman. I mean, I've read those things, but but I I have no knowledge of that. It, I, I you know I I don't know how this got going. Uh, you know, they're just w w developed a. Um, a cult of homosexuality in some of the seminaries, in some of the in, in some of the dioceses, and from that rose these homosexuals to p positions of power. How that happened, it, you know, I have no idea how that happened. I, 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 were they planted? You know, as I said in a recent column at Crisis Magazine, it, it was the most diabolical maneuver that the devil ever initiated, and that is to, to undermine our priesthood with an active network of homosexuals. Yeah. So, so even even more than communists, it was it was the devil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't you think? For sure, <laughs> obviously, yeah. and it's yeah. an attack on fatherhood. And and the worst thing about it is, is now. All priests, because of how widespread this is, we're not talking about just McCarrick. Um, we're talking about Honduras. We're talking about Chile. We're talking about yeah. Argentina. We're talking about Italy, you know, where a male prostitute publishes hundreds of names of clients. Yeah. Um, look at Ireland. You know, we have seminarians yeah. being kicked out of uh, Rome for, for homosexual acts. Uh, we have all kinds of problems in the Irish seminary. So it seems to be all over the place. And because of that, Lay people who love our priest, people who pray for their priest and their bishop daily, like we do, now we're all scratching our head and saying, "Well, whoa, who can I trust?" Yeah, yeah. You know, and even well, even yeah. dads are saying, "Well, can I have my son? Can I drop off my son for two hours on Saturday for altar boy practice?" Like we're having right. these conversations. It's horrible. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, well, not only know, do the bad ones that... do bad, the good ones are now suspect. Yeah. And and that's been true since two thousand and two. 
Uh, but now, it, but now it's even worse. You know, I want to go back to one thing you just said a second ago, and, and that is that it's it's a it's an attack on fatherhood. That was one of the things that Burke said to me uh, when I met with him in St. Louis a few weeks ago. He he said that the relationship between a bishop and seminarians is father to son. Yeah. So th- this was even incestuous what he was doing. Exactly. I, I wrote a, a post today saying that bishops are supposed to be fathers to the fathers. In other words, the bishop is the father to the priest. You know, we right. lay people, who is our shepherd? Who is our director? It's the pastor, the local pastor, right? The priest, yeah. who is his pastor? Who is his shepherd? Who does he go to? His bishop. Right. And it seems right. like in America, bishops have become more and more bureaucratic, more and more like CEOs, where the bishops are afraid that the priests are going to get him sued, and the priests are afraid that the bishop's going to hang him out to dry. And so well, you know, and, the and father-son believe- is gone. The pre, the I've heard priests say and read them writing this that uh, the you know the charter from 2002 to them was a betrayal of that relationship because it hung them out to dry. Yep. Yep. How do you? I wasn't Catholic in 2002. I remember reading about it as a as an Episcopalian as a Protestant. How is it different this time than it was in 2002 when when Boston broke open? Well, one of the things that's different is that uh, a lot of people like me um, believed that the bishops had done had just taken bad advice. Mm-hmm. You know, they listened to insurance guys, they listened to lawyers, they listened to psychologists, yeah. and based on that, they did the they they did what what the best advice told them to do, so that they should not be punished for moving guys around. You know, right. because they've gone through. They've gone through, you know, uh, psychological healing and all that kind of stuff. And 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 you have to keep it quiet for insurance reasons. And, and the lawyers are telling them that. And so I, I bought that. You know, I bought that. And and honestly, it, making that argument around that time with my friend Rod Dreher mm-hmm. uh, kind of kind of ruined our relationship back then. Right. You know, because, you know, he was going, you know, hell bent for leather and we were sort of defending, you know, right. what was really going on and, and saying, you know, this is highly limited. And, and you know, and, and a lot of that is still true. It was highly limited. You know, it, 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 there's now all this massive training. I mean, but if you go through Virtus training today uh, that allows you to work with young people in a Catholic setting, in Vir- Virtus training, they will still tell you what uh, the analyst at the John Jay report said, and that is that it had nothing to do with homosexuality, right. even though almost all of the cases were yeah. homosexual. Eighty percent. So, percent. so, so there's that. And so, what's different today is, man, I'm not buying what the bishops are saying. Yeah. You yeah, because now I, it seems I, like I, they they can't say, well, we sent them a psychologist. And all that. Now it's all we need better policies. Well, we're, we are hearing that. We are hearing that, you know, and, and setting up, you know, commissions or whatever. But, you know, the you know, I, I, I know a number of ish, uh, uh, initiatives that are that are happening right now that um, we'll see how they evolve. But my feeling is that none of these initiatives ought to include any bishops. But I mean, even that is unfair because there are good bishops who didn't know uh, who want to do the right thing. But I mean, so so the difference now is that I, I think that guys like me are mad as hell. Yeah. Whereas in 2002, we weren't necessarily. Yeah. Do you think um, your friendship with Rod Dreher, do you think that as a journalist, he knew more of the gooey details? And so he was able to 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 judge the situation more accurately than you were at that time? Well, he says so now. Yeah. For instance, he, he said in a, in, a, in a blog post that Boniface Ramsey was one of the priests who went to him back in those days. Okay. But but Ramsey and he said he said Rod said part of his problem was that nobody would go on the record and he couldn't go with that stuff unless somebody would put their name on it. Yeah. And, and he said Ramsey wasn't willing to put his name on it. Ramsey was working. He was writing to, you know, Cardinal Egan. He was writing to um, uh, Sean O'Malley. He was writing to Rome, working within the system as, as he knew that he probably should do and not go public. And so, yeah, Rod, I mean, even now Rod says he has things that he knows things that he, he can't say because nobody's willing to go on the record. Right. So he knows exponentially more. I mean, people are writing to him every day with with experiences that they know about. Yep, yep. Um, what is the, it's clear to me that any 
priest, deacon, bishop who is having sexual sexual relationships needs to be laicized. Agreed. That's my take on it. I read the church fathers. I read medieval things, canonical things from ages past. Um, there was an expectation, even to Thomas Aquinas, that if you become ordained a deacon, you no longer commit mortal sins. It's a big deal to enter mm. the diaconate and do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And he even says, priest, don't commit willful venial sins. So, like, he sees it as, like, the deacons are advanced in the purgative way, the priests are in the illuminative way, bishops are on the unitive way of perfection. Like, mm -hmm. that's the Thomistic ideal, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it just seems to me that, I mean, we're married men. If we cheat on our wives, that's gravely sinful in the impact mm -hmm. that it makes on our children, mm -hmm. our extended family, workplaces, everything is devastating. Absolutely yeah. devastating. And we know from Paul and from Trent, the priesthood, the celibate priesthood is a higher calling than matrimony. Mm -hmm. So they should be held to a higher standard. That's my take on it. Yeah. Well, I would even cast a wider net and, and it's certainly everything you say right there, but it's hard to say the following, but some people who knew what McCarrick did ought to have to answer for it. So that's some the people next who, question. So obviously if you commit these sexual crimes, you're done. No pension, no insurance, no retirement. You've abused your spiritual fatherhood and authority over people. You're a predator. You're out. Right. Right. Yeah. What what do we do to the bishops, cardinals who knew about it and shuffled priest, relocated them, maybe, you know, manipulated people into taking settlements to be quiet, to not go to the authorities. And then these things just keep repeating. Should they be laicized? Oh, so you're suggesting going back to 2002 and looking at who knew what, when and who was moving people around and. And, yeah. and just opening up all those We files. agree that McCarrick and the like should be laicized. I don't yeah. think he, he's not cardinal. I don't think he should be archbishop. You know, bishop means yeah. overseer. I don't want him overseeing anything. Yeah. He shouldn't even be, I mean, he's a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He can't take that away. It's on his soul. But he shouldn't be able to be publicly a priest to anyone. No pectoral yeah. cross, no Roman collar, nothing. Right? So I think everyone in that situation laicized. What about... The ones who no, wait a second, it. wait a second. What, what about those who knew everything that, that he did and looked the other yeah, way? So that's the next one. Guys? Are those guys, do they just, are they asked to resign or are they lay aside as well? I don't know. How strict do we get to but those something, guys? But something, yeah, yeah. something, something drastic. Um, I mean, to, if you're a bishop to, and you knew Father X molested a child and then Father X was in your diocese in public ministry year, two years, five years later, you need to be gone. Don't say child. Okay. Yes, you can say child, but as we know, most of those cases were post-pubescent mm -hmm. uh, boys uh, under, under the age, you know, between 14 and 18. And, and, and saying child makes it sound like pedophilia. When, right. And what this truly is, was homosexual predation of post-adolescent boys. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that goes by the name of pederasty. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, 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 yeah, we, you have, I, I think we need to find all of those guys and get rid of them, find those who knew about it and shuffle them around and do something. I don't know what, uh, investigate all of the lavender seminaries and, you know, close them down, <laughs> burn them to the ground and salt the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, it, we, as Janet Smith makes abundantly clear in her recent writing, the, um, the underlying issue of the network of homosexuals has to be smoked out and gotten rid of. Because right. as I said, that, that was the, as I described in a column at, at Crisis, that was the fetid sea in which they swam. Yes. Now, it you seems to me, you know, I agree, but we lay people have no canonical recourse to smoke anybody out. Well, that's kind of a problem. The only uh, but, person that I know who has canonical resources to do that is the Vicar of Christ. Right. Well, see, what, a, what, what, what laymen can do is put together their resources and hire retired FBI agents, mm -hmm. retired sex crimes investigators. And we are in touch with some of those right now 
who are eager to get going in investigations of this kind. And what do you do with that afterwards? I mean, laymen, uh, you right, have no power to do anything with that except for expose name and shame and then call these, you know, the, the, the shepherds to accounting for what they find. Um, on, there's another, another model uh, of, of a lay investigation that, in fact, includes a couple of bishops and includes approval from the Vatican that all the files have to be opened. But I, I think it has to be primarily a, a lay investigation with approval from the bishops. Well, but I it has to a be, lot of people would contend very aggressive. approval of the bishops weakens it. Well, because oof. they might put in, you know, James Martin's 12 favorite friends. Well, right. And, and that's why, you know, the, the, the lay team has to be appointed by Frank Keating. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's like Frank Keating needs to run this and, and there needs to be, you know, a good bishop, you know, who who signs off on it. Uh, but what I hear you say is that this can't have any real effect or real efficacy unless the vicar of Christ gives his okay. Uh, we'll see if that happens. But I mean, I think you're right. But failing that, it doesn't mean we can't do nothing. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't do nothing. We have to do everything that we can uh, with what's given us. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the old story. Just because the bishops aren't doing um, the right thing does not absolve us from doing the right thing. Like in the life issues, you know, your bishop yep. isn't doing enough doesn't mean that you're not supposed to do everything you can. And the, on all of these issues, including this one. Yeah. Uh, as the president of CFAM, what do you think about this return to, you know, the seamless garment, this idea that all issues related to human life and thriving are on par with the pro-life anti-abortion um, movement. We see, I, you know, I thought this was dead. I thought this was Cardinal Bernadine. I thought this was like 1980s, John Paul II buried it. And now it's like, you know, if you don't support total open borders, you're not pro-life. Right. Um, I, I would just refer back to the letter that uh, that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger wrote to the American bishops in 2004 that, that said explicitly, you know, you can even disagree on the death penalty, for instance, but you can't on the life issues. Um, you know, I, I think that there there's a renewed effort of this with, um, you know, people who would consider themselves and probably are considered Orthodox Catholics who, and I was just writing about this yesterday, who are uh, uneasy, unhappy, frustrated with the close relationship that has developed between uh, the pro-life movement and the Republican Party. And they think that there are other issues that are, that are important um, that the Republicans don't care about, and therefore they get short shrift. And this notion that the, a Catholic has no true home in any political party, which is nonsense. It's a, it's a nonsense equation. Um, but yeah, there's this renewed effort to uh, revive the seamless garment. Um, I wrote a column now many months ago asking the question, is the seamless, was the seamless garment always a scam? <laughs> because I looked at the, uh, at the 14 senators who voted, uh, who voted against closing debate on the question on, on, on a bill in, in the Senate that would had passed the House on uh, uh, ending abortion after the 20th week. And they voted against closing debate so a vote could be, could t be taken. And these were 17 or 14 Catholic senators, yeah. uh, t only two of them Republican, including, you know, Tim Kaine, you know, who was touted as this great seamless garment Catholic. And he, he worked in the slums of in South American cities and he was educated by Jesuits. And he's like the perfect seamless garment candidate. He voted against this. So it's a scam. It's a scam. Okay. It's always been a scam as a way to bring down the life issue so that these other issues so, so that, you know, the minimum wage can become just as important. Right. And yeah, it's, it is it is being revived. There's this cockamamie effort called uh, oh, the new pro-life movement. Yes, and these guys this. don't do anything. Yeah, they don't they don't really do anything. They just um, complain about pro-lifers not doing enough. 
That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, I would love it if uh, if uh, liberal pro-lifers uh, who somehow find an, an allegiance with the Democratic Party would come in and uh, I, I suggested this to one of them one day. Why don't you guys go after the insurance companies since you hate corporations, go after the insurance companies that fund abortion? That would be so fantastic. It would be. And that would be really beneficial. You know, the, it, it's in your wheelhouse. It's pro-life. It's, you know, anti-capital. Go do that. And, and they won't because pretty much their movement is all about going after us. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's an easy caricature because they want, us to see, they want us to be the heartless, mean, you know, all we are is capitalists. And we use right. pro-life as our shield. And we're, and we're not really and we're not really pro-life. We, you know, it's like if you read Mark Shea's blog at uh, at Patheos, he, you know, he just he right. goes off the deep end on this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, that we use babies as uh, as human shields yeah. for, you know, and and he says outright that you know that that, that we're the party of death, that that we want to kill immigrants, that we want to kill the right. poor. Right. And he says it. I mean, just lunacy. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the UN level, so outside of America, you know, we saw yeah. Ireland legalize abortion, um, all these stirrings in Argentina. It seems to me that the Pope and the bishops, when it comes to these giant tsunamis of moral policy in nations, are saying almost nothing. Well, you know, it's my understanding that the church got very involved in Argentina, and that was one of the reasons that we won there. Um, I don't, I, I, I've heard one of the complaints about Ireland is that they weren't very involved. I mean, part of the problem there, and this is the devil's work is Scandal. that their credibility was shot because of all this other stuff. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's the devil's work. And that was his intention is to take away the credibility of the bishops. So all these other things can happen. Um, you know, in my own work, you know, the Holy See mission is, is at the UN and they're, you know, they're, they're working on these documents all the time. Uh, the UN is actually pretty pro-life, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we've been at this now for going on 21 years, and we have blocked an international right to abortion. Uh, we have blocked a redefinition of family. We have blocked the incorporation of sexual orientation and gender identity as a new category of international law. You know, I mean, the other side isn't stopping, you know, but, but for the most part, CFAM and our coalition of NGOs and the Holy See and, and many other member states have blocked all this. What, what are the key um, member states that are helping y'all do that? It, you know, it depends upon the specific uh, uh, negotiation at that time because it, it's always changing. Mm -hmm. But the African countries, yeah. you know, I'm convinced that um, Africa is going to save the West. Mm -hmm. But before Africa does that, we need to save Africa mm -hmm. from who? From the European Union, yeah. from, you know, uh, American NGOs, from American left wing foundations yes. who are trying to subvert the family and the church in Africa. But I'm absolutely convinced that Africa can save the West. Um, CFAM, we've started uh, making small donations. We, we're helping put two girls through school in Kenya, and we're supporting uh, 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 a, a Catholic diocese in Uganda. Um, and I, I, I think that we're going to be doing much more of that just as a way to encourage the Africans and the Africans that we work with at the United, at the United Nations are brave, you know, and, and these countries have smaller delegations than I have. I mean, I, where there, there are six of us full time, their delegations might be two or three. And so we work very closely with them almost on a staff level to help them understand documents and the language that they ought to use. But yeah, it's the Africans who are doing the heavy lifting now. The Muslims come in, they help out a great deal, uh, including from unsavory states. Um, you know, they're not pro-life in the way that we are. Um, I think that mostly they object to radical feminists at the UN trying to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, they're very anti-LGBT agenda. Uh, so they're very solid on that. So, you know, we work with Russia. Yeah. Don't tell the FBI. <laughs> we work with Russia. Um, <laughs> and you know, we have for years. One of the wild cards, you know, I kind of feel like I understand, you know, somewhat a political... Um, allegiance and trends in Europe and Africa, East Asia, Russia, and the United States. South America, though, is completely confusing to me. And part of it has to do with because our Pope is from South America, so it's, it's forced us to focus on that way of thinking. Um, on the, at the UN level, what are the South American nations asking for or pursuing? What, what's their deal? What, what, how does a South American think? 
You know, South America, the, the elites in South America believe that, um, well, they want to be like their European betters. So right. the elites in, in, in Latin America are, are very uh, pro-abortion. They're very, uh, you know, anti-family and pro-gay this and gay that. But the people are pretty darn conservative. Um, and, you know, it's, it's still a very Catholic continent. Uh, the Pentecostal movement has been has been growing by leaps and bounds. Um, so there's this European influence, which is very radical. Uh, there's still some homegrown radicals, but this is this this will blow your mind. The Sandinistas, 100% pro-life in Nicaragua, 100% pro-life. What the interesting thing about the social issues in uh, in um, look, you you shrunk. You, you, I leaned you back. Just, you just shrunk. You went, whoa, you got very small. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, the left wing in Latin America can be just as pro-life and pro-family as you or me. Right. It's one of the weird things. Mm -hmm. You know, this this uh, I think there's like a socialist or whatever who runs Ecuador. You know, he's pro-life and pro-family. The Sandinista is pro-life and pro-family. Many years ago, um, the, the, San the, the, the Nicaraguan national legislature made abortion illegal for any reason. And they came mm. under like this severe attack from Sweden and Norway. And, and these countries said, if you don't change this law, we're going to withhold, you know, our, 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 our money from you. And this is after the a massive hurricane hit this many years ago. And, and, the, and the Sandinista government says, tough. You know, we're, we're a pro-life country. So it, it just depends. Okay. Um, but for the most part, and, you know, during the Menem days when he was president of Argentina, they were very, very aggressive on, on, the, on the life issues. Um, you know, some of the countries down there where abortion is, is truly against the law. It just depends. I mean, the thing about Latin America, it's huge. And there are lots and lots of countries. Um, the, the Caribbean countries are generally quite good. Uh, the Caribbean country. Yeah. <laughs> One thing a lot of people don't know is take Jamaica. Uh, a lot of people don't know that a lot of the Jamaican, uh, the, the reggae songs mm -hmm. are anti-gay, explicitly hmm. anti-gay. Like reggae it's music? Like, like reggae music. Yeah. A lot of reggae stars have been banned in the UK because they're explicitly anti-gay. Yeah. And so American teenagers, you know, over the years have been dancing to this reggae music, uh -huh. which is anti-gay. I mean, really yeah. anti-gay. Gay. Yeah. So, so the Caribbean nations are are quite conservative on on life issues, on family issues. Um, it, it just depends. But Europe has spent a boatload of money there. Um, China has spent billions of dollars building relationships. We had a conference in Costa Rica now many years ago, and uh, near our hotel was this massive uh, soccer complex. And when we were there, it happened to be the open day of this. And there were fireworks. And I said, what is that? And they said, that was a gift of the Chinese government. Easily a billion dollar yeah. facility. Yeah. So they're very busy. Um, and the problem is the United States has let it slide. Hmm. You know, the United States, uh, you'd think under Bush, who's, you know, uh, or, or somebody would have made Latin America a priority, but yeah. they're letting it slip away in Venezuela and elsewhere. To the Chinese? Well, in Venezuela, to you know, hardcore author authoritarian right, right. communism. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, in, in terms of Chinese influence, I, I think that they're just buying influence down there. Yeah. Um, how this plays out at the UN is, you know, mo most Latin American countries are not very, um, they're 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 not very good allies ever. Mm -hmm. Like I said, some in, some in the Caribbean, but for the most part, no. Yeah. You know, one of the things that helps a lot is when. You know, back in, in the, the original Cairo conference days and the Beijing conference days and JP2 was there, Navarre Valls was there, um, they would be very aggressive in sending out what are known as demarches, which are, you know, messages from the Vatican foreign minister to the, their colleagues saying, this is what we want. We want your help to do it. And, and so whenever, I'll tell you what, whenever the Vatican sends out demarches on the UN negotiations, we win. But they haven't done it in a very long time. How long? How long has it been? We're talking decades, five years, ten years? Well, you know, um, during Rio plus 20, I think, uh, the, and I don't remember who, I guess Benedict was Pope then. Okay. They said not to Marshes and we want a massive negotiations at, at Rio okay. plus 20.
but I think not since then. So, hmm. so, you know, since Francis, since Benedict, yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. Okay. Let's talk your books. You wrote two books last year. That's quite a feat. Um, <laughs> did you write them at the same time or sequentially? Well, I tell you what, I finished one on like August 31st, uh, and started the next one the very next day. Wow. That's how Excellent. I did it. And it, it was, uh, it was, uh, pretty stupid, uh, <laughs> to, to do it. Uh, you know, uh, the littlest suffering souls is uh, a book about th three children. It's about, it's about three children who suffered greatly, died young and brought many people to the faith. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know all three families. Um, and that's, that's how I came to write this book is that I wrote a series of columns about these kids. Um, you know, uh, Brendan Kelly, who died at the age of 14, uh, uh, a Down syndrome boy who suffered with leukemia throughout his life. Um, and, and I, his family lived two miles that way. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, Margaret Leo, um, little girl who died also at 14 a few mm -hmm. years ago, her, uh, she died from complications of spina bifida. Mm -hmm. Her father's Leonard Leo, um, who's the head of the Federalist Society, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the board of the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast with me. Uh, back in the day, um, and he's the guy who's probably most responsible for Gorsuch and mm. Kavanaugh. Right. Um, you know, um, so I know I knew I knew Margaret, uh, and then the third was this little girl from Paris named Audrey Stevenson, and I have worked with her parents. They they live in Paris. I've worked with her parents on international pro life issues for twenty years. So it's like I just knew all these amazing stories, and they're all the same story. You know, when Audrey Stevenson was in. Um, when she was in the, you know, sterile room during her bone marrow transplant, which is a very unpleasant experience, they, you know, and, and she couldn't, she couldn't, she could see her parents through this little win window, uh, but they could hear her singing songs to Mary mm -hmm. while she was getting her bone marrow transplant. Yeah. When Brendan Kelly was getting his bone marrow transplant, he was offering his suffering for Bella Santorum, who's a neighbor nearby. Yeah. And Rick and, Santorum's and, daughter. Santorum's daughter. Yeah. And to this day, uh, the Santorum's credit Brendan's prayers with the fact that she lived and still lives. Wow. Um, so it's just these amazing stories. And Margaret Leo, um, to this day, her picture is, uh, is on the desk of Clarence Thomas in a frame made out of popsicle sticks that she made. Wow. And, and there have been genuine miracles since her passing. Um, uh, that, uh, that I believe to be true mm -hmm. and that I put in the book. Um, so they're just amazing stories. So I wrote some columns about these kids, the Catholic thing, yep. and the response was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It was hundreds of requests for their prayer cards, you know, from all over the world. And I started getting stories, similar stories from all over the world. So it was like, a, there's something really important going yeah. on. And so I was, I was with the guys at Tan Books and they wanted me to write a book about contraceptive politics. And I said, you know what, I'd like to really write this book. And I explained it mm -hmm. to the, these two editors and they, and they said, wait one second. And they left the room and they came back with everybody in the company. And they said, tell that story again. Awesome. And they basically bought it on the spot. Good. Um, so it's, it's a really important stories for people to know in this day and age. What's the common denominator on that? I'm curious from these three are from all over the world. Is this a piety that they receive from their parents or is it infused in some miraculous or different way? Well, both. Okay. Um, uh, Audrey Stevenson's story in some ways is the most remarkable because she came from a largely unchurched family and she brought the faith into the family. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like both Jerome, who is my daughter Gigi's godfather, and uh, and Lillianne, who comes from an old Catholic family hmm. um, uh, in Chicago, but they had fallen away from the practice of the faith. And then Jerome wasn't even going to church at all. Okay. Uh, and Lillian was trying to get the family, you know, involved. But at the age of three, in this unchurched family, one day Lillian found that three-year-old uh, Audrey had decorated the house, every room, with a crudely drawn crucifix. Wow. Yeah. So All that's that's a su supernatural own. infused knowledge of and she and she, you know, and she piety. She was doing so many, uh, one day, she was four years old, being walked home from school with her mother, and she was limping. 
And uh, Lillian says, why are you limping? And, and she tried to hide it, but Lillian discovered that she had put pencils in her shoe. Why did you put pencils in your shoe? She said, well, it's easier to carry them that way. And Lillian said, now, why did you put them? She said, and what she said, she said this French word, je resist, I resist. Mm. She was teaching herself mortification yeah. and yeah. nobody taught her that, yeah. nobody. Amazing. And so they eventually went to their local parish priest and laid out all these amazing things that were going on. What should we do? And you know what he said? Follow her. Yeah. And they did. And then two or three years later, she came down with uh, with leukemia. And uh, it's wonderful stories in the book. You know, they were in the hospital. She'd just been diagnosed. And Lillian said, you know, we're going to get through this. We're going to listen to whatever the doctor says and whatever he does, we're going to do. And everything's going to be fine. And at that point, seven-year-old uh, uh, Audrey said, Mommy, we're going to do what Jesus said. We're going to live like the birds in the trees, hmm. day by day. Yeah. Hmm. Beautiful. Seven-year-old girl said yeah. that. Yeah. And this is how she lived, and, and prayer groups sprung up all over France for her, and, and men who hadn't said the rosary in 25 years were saying the rosary with their families. And it was just, just – and her prayer card went all over the world. It was just just phenomenal what happened. Yeah. So so yeah, and 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 so you look at Margaret Leo. She she was raised in a faithful Catholic family, but you know she turbocharged her family's yeah. faith. And to this day, there are people at the at the uh, cathedral in Arlington who remember her prayer after communion, where she would say out loud, "Thank you, Jesus, for coming to me in communion today." Wow. Quite simple. Yeah. But people. At the cathedral, say that to this day because of her. Nice. Uh, and and then Brendan, you know, Down syndrome boy, who you know came from a faithful Catholic family, uh, who just he had this remarkable gift for bringing people out of their shell. You know, he he recognized suffering in others, and he would just become a pest, then and just you know bring people out of themselves. And one girl converted because of him. Probably others did too. Um, yeah, just amazing stories of these three children. So yes, two of them born in faithful Catholic families, but then turned it into something marvelous. Mm -hmm. and one girl born in an unchurched family and introduced the faith there. So, but the yeah. thing about it is, is all of these kids were, I, I don't want to run down or say anything critical about this girl Santos, who, you know, um, in, in Boston, who has been in a coma for 20 years and, and people think that there's miraculous things happening around her. Uh, she's not sentient. You know, these children knew exactly what was happening to them. They knew that they were sick. They knew that they were probably dying. Right. They were suffering greatly. Mm -hmm. And they nonetheless turned it into gold. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, we, we worry about these problems with uh, ex-Cardinal McCarrick and all these scandals. And it seems that in every age, you know, there's the magisterium of the church, the pope and the bishops. But there's this, you know, I'm going to use the word charismatic. There is this charismatic, mystical magisterium that bubbles up from children like these, you know, who are yeah. inspiring devotion to the Eucharist and gratitude after receiving communion. You right. know, I'm thinking of the Catherine of Siena's and the Joan of Arcs and the Martin de Poors and, you know, the people who aren't wearing scarlet, you know, mm -hmm. visiting the Vatican four times a year. Yeah. Uh, these people have been able to, to bring about faith, renewal, devotion to the Eucharist, devotion to Our Lady, um, and maybe that's, you know, what we'll be seeing hopefully in the decades to come are beautiful, holy families, you know, stunning children with a deep life of mental prayer and love for Our Lady and the Eucharist. And, you know, it, we don't necessarily have to have it come from a bishop is what I'm saying. Is that we can right. still, we can take our eyes off of, off of this level on earth where we have our bishops and our, you know, our priests and cardinals and they're all there for a purpose and part of, part of God's plan but we can always look up and see these these saints and these angels and these little ones who have gone before us and um and find our strength and our courage in these little saints right i mean yeah. i mean is there yeah. any is there any movement towards a, a beatification for these young people or you said you mentioned prayer cards i mean how far does this go the um, the cause for uh, Audrey's uh, uh, beatification actually started in Paris wow. some years ago, but it became stalled. And here's the reason. Um, Jerome and Lillian, who were no longer involved in Regnum Christi, 
Uh, were the first Regnum Christi couple in in France. I see. And so that redounded negatively to the advancement of Audrey's cause. Um, so so the 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 Archbishop of Paris has not assigned um, uh, what's the word for the person who quarterbacks that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, neither do I. Yeah. Um, I, I I have known the name, but I don't know Canonical it at the second. Canonical cheerleader, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it stalled a little bit. Okay. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that I wrote the book, and I, I did a uh, extensive interviewing on tape with with the moms and dads and brothers and sisters, is precisely to give that mm-hmm. to whatever process that may be. So, uh, I, you know, um, Margaret Leo. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a Margaret Leo mar- miracle story. Um, Margaret Leo is just. Sitting is little girl slumped in a wheelchair, you know, always in the wheelchair her whole life. Big smile across her face. The happy, joyful girl, you know. Um, and uh, there's a man here in town named uh, Ed Whalen. Yeah. And Ed Whalen yeah. is a highly – you remember Ed from yeah, the CIC. Sure. Yeah, sure. very influential guy. Yes. He's the head of the Ethics and Public Policy mm-hmm. Center. He's worked in the White House uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee and uh, uh, high up in the Justice Department. Very influential guy. So um, uh, one day, uh, right before she died, Ed's father met her at a softball game, talked to her for a little while. And uh, when he walked away, he said, uh, I just met a living saint. Hmm. OK. Shortly thereafter, Margaret dies. Hmm. Shortly after that, Ed Whalen's father has a cerebral hemorrhage. And is going to die. Wow. And the Waylands asked the Leos, old, old friends of theirs, to pray for Margaret's intercession. And within a month, everything was gone. Wow. I believe everything was gone. Yeah. So it's like, you know, he met her on a softball field and she saved his life. Yeah. From beyond. Yeah. So, you know, that story is, you know, so, so these, these so is that moving are, forward? I mean, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty, it's a tight miracle. I mean, yeah, is that, is that yeah, enough to move, so. move forward for a beatification or a venerable? You know, it's a very interesting question. I, I think that the uh, Leos are reticent themselves to take the idea to the bishop. So maybe they're waiting for somebody else and maybe I should be the one that takes these stories to yeah. the bishop. Uh, we, we have a new bishop, uh, Burbage. He's been here for a couple of years. Good, solid man. Um, uh, he, uh, yeah, good, solid man. Good, solid man. So sitting here talking to you, I mean, maybe I am supposed to take it to him. Yeah. Somebody's supposed to take it to him. Yeah, you're the, Why not me? You're the yeah. initial uh, hagiographer on this. You know? Yeah, that's you right. You wrote the first, right. the first accounts. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so maybe I will. Good. Now, you, the next book that you wrote after that, within just a few months right, was fake science. Tell us about that. Fake science is, uh, and the, um, the, the subtitle always throws me because it's long, exposing the left's uh, fuzzy facts, dodgy data, and skewed statistics or something like that. And this was, Regnery came to me and asked me if I would write this book, and I, I, I agreed to, and, and uh, mostly because I wanted to work with Regnery for the very first time. Um, and uh, it's a book about uh, a, a dozen issues uh, where the left says the science is settled, but the science is settled only in an ideological way, right. you know, and, and therefore it's fake science. And we look at abortion. You know, the, the lies about abortion are, mani- you know, m- myriad, thousands yes. and thousands of lies. You know, when does life begin? When does pregnancy begin? Um, and all that, kind of, you know, what, what does Roe v. Wade really say? Yeah. Um, and we looked at, uh, at marriage, you know, and I, and, and I looked, I went back to the, to the dawn of the divorce culture and showed what, you know, what marriage and family was like, like right before the divorce culture kicked in in the mid 60s and then what happened afterwards and, and the lies that were told that that women, for instance, would be much happier. Major, major uh, uh, scholarly books telling women that they would be much happier if they divorced. Yeah. Um, you know, the, it, it was a real bandwagon. So I, I talk about the lies there and, and you know, uh, who's happier, married women or single women, married women or divorced women, children raised by two, two men or children. Children raised by by mom and a dad, yep. and the social science is all on our side. Yeah. But nonetheless, the left. But if you publish that. it, you get in trouble or silenced. Yeah, 
That's right. We talk about Regnerus and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Uh, and we looked at homosexuality and the lies that are told about homosexuality, you know, that it's inborn and unchangeable mm-hmm. um, and transgenderism. Well, I, I looked at poverty. You know, um, there are a lot of lies about poverty, my friend. You know, the, 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 the average poor person in the United States has more. The majority of poor people in the United States own their own home. The, the average living space of a poor person in the United States is larger than the living space of a middle class person in most of Europe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and all, all of these. No, I, I've done, you know, volunteer work at the homeless shelter. And I'm just, you know, even years ago, like five years ago, I was surprised they all had their own cell phone and their own cell plan. Oh, is you that know? right? Yeah. 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 And, you know, most of them are, you know, not all, but the ones who are really into drugs are very frail. But most of them are, you know in good, you know, good shape, even overweight, you yeah. know, um, we have a great social, I'm, I'm not trying to excuse poverty at all, but I've yeah. been amazed by the belongings and the well-being of, of many homeless people that I've spent the afternoon with, you know? <laughs> you know, one of the remarkable things that I, that I discovered in my research is, uh, is the work of Robert Rector at, at the Heritage Foundation on this. And, and he shows, I mean, well, Department of Labor st- poverty statistics show that um, one of the uh, uh, main, main drivers of, well, let, uh, let me back up just for one second. The federal government no longer measures hunger in America. Hmm. Did you know that? Didn't know that. They don't, and it doesn't measure hunger in America because they couldn't find any. Hmm. What, so they changed the terms to uh, food security, low food, food security, high food security. And, and, and uh, most of the people with food insecurity spend an average of two packs of cigarettes a day hmm. that could go to the household budget. Right. They drink a lot of sodas out of vending machines. Hmm. And so you, you put all of this together right. and you're looking at what could be another couple hundred dollars in the family budget um, at the end of the month if they just gave up these things, including fast food. Yes. You know, fast food. Very expensive. You know, it's very expensive, especially on a per calorie basis. You know, rice and beans is very cheap, yeah. you know, compared to uh, uh, a Big Mac. Yeah. So if you factor in all of these things, then you then even the people with low food security won't necessarily have food security anymore. Mm. So it was remarkable things I discovered. Boy, did I get lambasted by the Catholic left on this. Now, what do you, you know? I, let's talk briefly about transgenderism. What's some of the research you found there? Because I'm, I'm just increasingly discouraged and amazed that these parents and these teachers and these doctors are putting puberty blockers yeah. into pre-adolescent kids. I mean, injecting yeah. them with hormones. We don't know what this does. This is, this is Frankenstein's monster here. Um, puberty blockers have never been tested on uh, young people for the purposes of sex uh, sex reassignment. They, they've been used when somebody somebody's uh, uh, pituitary gland is going crazy. Hmm. It can be controlled with puberty blockers. Okay. Uh, so it's been tested for that, but it's never been tested for this. Um, you know, the usual, the typical lies that are going on about uh, transgenderism is that it's inborn, that it's in the brain, that it's in the gene, even though none of these things have ever been shown. Right. Um, and, and as you say, the, saying that puberty blockers and sex change operations are perfectly fine. Uh, I, I relied heavily on a very important paper by uh, Paul McHugh. Uh, former head of psychiatry at uh, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, Lawrence Mayer, who's one of the most accomplished statisticians and other things. Uh, and they, they went and they looked at five or 600 studies on homosexuality and, trans- and, and gender and transgender to, to look at the claims and the validity of all of these studies. And they found that none of these studies are um, statistically valid. Hmm. Um, so that there's a, a, a remarkable amount of lies yeah. being foisted upon the American people. I mean, I'll give you a great statistic, and, and, and this is a, a, a political statistic, um, and that is uh, the 10 percent number. You know, there was a time when everybody in the United States believed that 10 percent of the population was, was homosexual. Um, 10 this, percent? 10 percent. This, wow. And they said it came, and they said it came from the Kinsey study, which, okay. was, a, which was a criminal study, as you yeah. likely know. Yeah. They did experiments, sexual experiments on babies. Um, and 
But Kinsey said, that's not even Kinsey's number. Kinsey said 13% for women and 7% for men. But a mm. homosexual activist who was going to meet Jimmy Carter in 1976 needed one number. So he put them together and said it was 10%. And he said he totally made it up. Huh. Well, as a matter of fact, um, and today this 10% number has transmogrified. According to, I think, the Pew study, if the typical American believes that 20% of the population is gay, and the typical millennial believes that 25% of the population is gay. And mm. these um, inborn, unchangeable, and everywhere, and just like us, were the primary arguments that they used before Obergefell. And most of that right. is false. Yes. Um, and so the real number of, of homosexual in America, like according two? to CDC, is 1.6 percent. 1.6. 1.6 yeah. percent. I mean, there, there there are more Methodists in America than there are uh, homosexuals. Right. There are more ex-gays than there are active gays. Is that right? So hmm. so yeah. So I looked at that. Um, I, I just looked across the board, and it was it was a really fun book to do. Yeah. We sold a lot of copies. I bet. Yeah. Why is it that you know you can't get a tattoo till you're 18? You can't buy cigarettes, but you can have a sex change. This is insanity. Yeah, yeah. It, it's because there is a, a a part of the population that is completely protected. Um, I just wrote a column that, gosh, it was tr shared 1,100 times at the stream last week uh, about this little girl named Lucy McHale, who's in the Montgomery County school system in, in suburban Maryland, suburban Washington, D.C. And and uh, she was uh, she's standing up to the LGBT movement there in her school and then coming under. She's being bullied and, and all sorts of stuff. Well, what happens in this situation is that there is a protected class, and that is the LGBTs. She is not protected. She's not protected. Um, a boy leaned across the counter at the snack bar at the local pool where Lucy was working and demanded a kiss from another little boy. Lucy objected, and she came under bullying in her school for having objected. Uh, so she's she's not protected. Right. Um, the school put on this gaudy display for so-called Pride Month. Um, and she went to a principal and said, you know, can we have a traditional marriage display? And the principal said, well, no, you know, we want to make sure everybody feels included. And yeah. Lucy, 14 year old Lucy said, I don't feel included. Yeah. So so there's there's a protected group. And this goes to your question is that they are protected. You know, the, the tattoo parlors are not protected. You know, kids wanting a tattoo are not protected. Kids wanting a sex change operation are protected by the state. And why is that? Because who, these is, guys, who is funding it? Who is promoting it? What's the end game? I don't see any win out, they, of, they, out of this. I, they just hold a tremendous amount of power these days. Who's they? Uh, the gays. You know, the sort of establishment gays. So and, is it an attack the, just and, on gender? Is that Because I I've, I've understand some homosexuals are very opposed to the transgender movement. They don't like it. There's, well, they'll I'll say, you oh, what? you think you're gay well, and you just want to become a woman. Maybe you're just a gay man. And they, they actually see trans as sort of offensive. Some of them. I wrote about that in the book. There yeah. are a lot of them that are feeling that way. And, and, and second wave feminists feel that way, that, that, that transgender you know, women who are yeah. men uh, are really invading a female space. Yeah. Why you know, does when, Caitlyn when, Jenner get to be the winner? Is what they're right. saying. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. We've been so, all the time. you know, to your point, I think that there is an, 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 a possible fault line in that movement, uh, precisely along these lines. Uh, uh, but the gays have boatloads of money and boatloads of public goodwill, even among people who aren't gay. You know, in my own family, I mean, they, they say, "Why are you so critical of the gays?" You know, why they, they're just trying to live their lives and all that kind of stuff. They're just like us. They want a white picket fence, and so they, they've done. They have a lot of money. They got Hollywood. They got the major newspapers. I mean, I gave up the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Finally, when they became like all gay all the time. Yeah. You know, that was one thing that I put in, in, in my book is I looked at the number of times transgender was mentioned in the New York Times 15 years ago. And it was only within the context of LGBT, mm -hmm. never standalone. Yeah, and yeah. then after after Obergefell, it went through the roof. Exactly. You know, the, the gays pivoted to an issue because, you know, once. Once they got gay marriage, I mean, what else is there? You know, people are going to turn away. So they ginned up the transgender issue mm -hmm. and, and all these poor people who just, you know, think they're born in the wrong body and all that kind of stuff. So they got a lot of money, a lot of influence. They hold all the 
the the universities, the you know, the news media, public Hollywood, schools, public schools. Public and, schools. And what's their end game? I mean, you know, I'm a Catholic. I want everyone to be Catholic. I'd love for them to experience the Eucharist and the sacraments and the rosary and like my way of life. I think it's great, and I would like everyone on Earth to experience it. But what do they know, want? Yeah, but I don't want to like push it on people. You know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't make a Muslim child pray a Hail Mary or a rosary. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a Mormon kid kneel down and do Eucharistic adoration. What do they want? Why are they trying to bend wills? What's the they thing? want um, no opposition whatsoever because any opposition shows that they might be wrong. I mean, that's why... That's why they're coming after Lucy McHale. But, but here's She's the thing. 14. You and I don't think that way. If someone says, I think Catholicism's dumb, I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't then go yeah. squirrel away money and get lobbyists and get people to stop saying. Like, it doesn't bother me. Because we are more secure in our Catholicism than they are in okay. their sexual perversity. You know, they know in the, their heart of hearts that what they're doing is wrong. You know, unless their unless their intellect has been completely darkened, mm -hmm. but I mean, even then, there's there's got to be some question. You know, the, you know, because you know, coming home after a night in the you know in the clubs or whatever, like a little prick of of conscience, maybe this isn't the thing I should be doing. But it, Bob Riley wrote about this extensively in a wonderful book called Making Gay Okay. And, and because they know in their heart of hearts what they're doing is wrong, they have to stamp out any opposition and only have people who support them so that their consciences will be assuaged and comforted. Yeah. Have you read Making Gay Okay? I haven't, no. Uh, it's, it's a Royal, must read. Royal wrote it? No, Bob Riley, Robert Bob Riley. Riley. Robert Riley, okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Amazing man who yeah. lives not far from here. Yeah. Uh, I, Expert on... Thanks. Before we close up, I was interested. You said that there are, it's something I'd never heard before, there are more ex-homosexuals than there are homosexuals. Where does that number come from? Never heard of that. Well, I don't, I don't have a number for that. The okay. ex-gays that I know say that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I've got nothing to back that up with. Okay. Um, but, you know, here's a very fun fact. There are more gays married to women than there are married to men. You know, we, we were told this was this is from Pew also. We were told that there was this pent up desire of gays to get married. And you know what? They've hardly moved the needle at all since Obergefell. And there are more gays married to women today than who are married to men. That's a fact. But wouldn't someone just say, well, that's they're just trying to have beers or just trying to hide in the closet. Now we can let them out. Maybe okay. they could say that. Right. That doesn't change the fact that that's what the statistic right. is. I, I I can't know the motivation of all those. I mean, you know, they could also say, well, you know, they, they got married, they want to have kids, you know, in the regular way. Um, I don't know, but that is a fact. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. And and the key fact there is that the the needle on married gays has not appreciably changed in the few years since Obergefell. So the rate's not going up. It's tiny. It's still yeah, tiny. Yeah. It, no, no, it's it, it's gone up a smidge. Okay, but not very much. Not very much. Yeah, it was never, as you know, never about man, these guys wanting to get married. Right. It, I, I'm convinced it was all about um, sticking it to um, Christians, mm -hmm. sticking it to those who might have criticized them when they were kids. You know, it's 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 kind of it's more payback than yeah. a genuine desire to get yeah. married. Yeah, it's like the it's like the wedding cake again. If I went. Yeah. to the grocery store and said, hey, I need a first communion wedding cake. And the Jewish baker says, I don't make those. I would laugh out loud and go to the next grocery store. I don't care. You know what? I, you know what? I wouldn't even laugh out loud. I would get it. I would, oh, I, yeah. I get that. I mean, I, I, I love the Jews, you know, it's, it's, the yeah. more orthodox, the better. Right. Yeah, I, I would have no problem with that or at all. Or Muslim or any, or so I'm an atheist. Yeah. I don't want to make that cake. I'd be like, okay, I'll take my money somewhere else. I wouldn't pursue the court. I just don't understand just how because vigilant the thing is. There can there can be no resistance, mm -hmm. none, and they and they want everybody to know that you can't resist. You know, a couple of years ago, I did a story at Breitbart. I, I, I got this story from from Robbie George that uh, uh, J P Morgan Chase, the fourth largest or maybe even the largest financial institution in the world, sent out a global survey to all uh, employees asking a bunch of questions with their name on it. And one of them was, are you LGBT or an ally? 
or an ally. Now, or oh, an ally. So you have to pick, it's binary? You Are you LGBT or an ally? Or an ally, okay. It's not, it, yeah, so you have to check that box. Yes, I am one of them. Right, yeah, it's a binary and decision. The, you have to choose one or the and, other. And if you're not, if you're a Christian who thinks this is, you know, so Robbie started getting calls from people at J.P. Morgan Chase who were afraid to answer the question. Yes. And so I, I wrote the story about it. And and there were a lot of, there are people all over corporate America who were afraid to let people know that they're Christian. Of course. Let alone that they're against gay marriage because yeah. they can get fired from things they say on social media, from yeah. things that they say to a friend over lunch. Yeah. Yeah. I was told by, by some Christians in Silicon Valley, you don't, say I'm in a Bible study. You don't say I went to church on Sunday in no public kidding. or at dinner parties. No. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, they immediately yeah. assume that you're just, you hang people, you remember the KKK, you're these evil Christian people. Right. It's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And that's right. And it's, that's San Francisco. So, well, to close, what is the, um, what's the greatest danger we have as Americans, or maybe you can answer it as Catholics right now, and then what's our biggest hope? Because there's a lot of people right now, I think, that are scourged. I think the uh, Pennsylvania grand jury report, does that come out today, or has it come out? Uh, I don't know if or it's this week. Out it's yeah. coming out soon, uh, and one bishop said that it's going to challenge a lot of people's faith. Um, the, the, greatest challenge, so, the, the greatest challenge that we have is, um, is the devil is alive and on the move. You know, um, he hates the church. He hates the family. He hates human beings. And, and there are, you know, there are demons swirling around the heads of our children, Yeah. you know, and, and wanting to drag them, you know, into the sexual revolution and to hell, yeah. you know, uh, that's the biggest challenge, but the biggest hope. And the, the next book that I do after, my book with um, with uh, Cardinal Burke is is based on a talk that I give called No Finer Time to Be a Faithful Catholic. And I give this talk and people at the end of it are standing and cheering because they're hearing things that they forgot. Yeah. And, and one of the main things is God put us on this earth at a time of maximum danger. <laughs> and how wonderful is that? He trusts the likes of you and me yeah. to do his right. battle. Yeah, and that's remarkable. He's equipping we're, us we're, too. We're, yeah, we're, we are not. You know, we don't live in a time of complacent Catholicism where it would be easy to slide and even lose your faith. Here, you have to fight for your faith, and God put this big battle in our feeble hands. And we also have lived through a remarkable time in the church. And I'm going to save that for my book. There, when you look awesome. at the last 15, 20 years in the church including what's going on now, it is one of the most remarkable epics the church has ever lived through. Agreed. So I, I say it's a better time to be a faithful Catholic than the second century. Wow, that's big. You know, I want to get, just close with something about, you said the devil is here, he's swirling around our children. And I want to encourage everybody watching to do the same. Every night you might do it with your children as well. I pray a prayer and I just say, if there are any unclean spirits, any demons in our home or affecting or tempting any of the 10 of us, we bind them in the blood of Jesus and send them to the foot of the cross to be judged, never to bother us again. Whoa. We pray that every night. It's, a, it's like a binding prayer. A priest taught it to me, my old spiritual director. S send that to me in an okay, email. Okay, I will. And then, um, and then each one of my kids, they line up and I bless them on the forehead. I invoke their patron saints, you know, so like Saint, may St. Jude pray for you, St. Ambrose, may your name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because the demons are getting into our homes through computers, TVs. I mean, we yeah. have to be so vigilant as parents through negative influences at school, yeah. mobile phones, even if it's not your kid's mobile phone, someone else's. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much trash and there's so much demonic activity and we're more and more post-Christian that we really do need to be daily cleansing out our homes of these evil influences through prayer, through devotion, through blessing our kids, which we can do as Catholic parents. Yeah. So, um, nice. you know, even if you don't have kids, pray those prayers, you know, yeah. and stay close to Our Lady and, and uh, the Church, the Eucharist. And this has been great, Austin. This has been really fun. Yeah. I've learned yeah. a lot. I'm doing this. very grateful to be brought on. Yep. Okay. Well, we'll do it again next time. And your books can get, you can get them on Amazon, Barnes and yep. Noble. You can get them on Amazon. The places. Put my name in and uh, they'll Bruce. both pop up. And, and uh, they are yeah. fake science. What's the, what's the subtitle? Uh, exposing the left's uh, skewed statistics 
fuzzy facts and dodgy data. Yep, but just it. fake science. Put in my name, Austin. Fake Bruce. science. And the other and one both is both of them will come out. And the other one's little, little suffering, little souls. suffering souls. Excellent. Children whose young life, short lives, point us to Christ. Excellent. Well, thanks so if much. If you're not, if you're not crying by page fourteen, you get your money back. Okay, guaranteed. All right. <laughs> well, thanks, Austin. God bless you. Okay. Thank you.